So I've been asked to talk on this historical perspective of bloodless medicine and surgery. But first of all, my uh, disclaimers uh, need to be shown. Uh, the most important one is I'm a potential patient and so I have a vested interest in uh, good patient outcomes. Carl Sagan once said, you have to know the past to understand the present. Uh, Albert Einstein said, if you want to know the future, look at the past. So from a histor historical perspective, this is a, a very famous photograph. I'm not sure if you recognize any of the people in this photograph. You'll certainly know some of them by name. This is 1944 at Johns Hopkins. This is Alfred Blaylock and his surgical assistant, Vivian Thomas, performing the first repair of Tetralogy of Fallow, which really ushered in the modern era of cardiac surgery. But perhaps more importantly, uh, this is a young uh, surgical intern, Dr. Denton Cooley, who uh, most of us will know as a, a, a real pioneer of bloodless surgery. He's one of the most awarded cardiac surgeons. Uh, he um, um, implanted the first artificial heart. He performed the first heart transplant in the US. And he also is, uh, was involved in the early work on uh, cardiopulmonary bypass with a heart lung machine. And, and a number of he and his colleagues were working on this and they were all commonly seeing um, uh, adverse effects of, of the blood when they primed the heart lung machine with, with blood. And Robert Litwack, who was the mentor of another uh, very famous uh, bloodless cardiac surgeon, Dr. Manny Estioko, it was Robert Litwack who described this as the homologous blood syndrome. So they were, they were seeing complications with both the dogs they were doing experiments with and with patients when they primed the heart lung machine with blood. And this led to what Nick and Cooley popularized as a bloodless prime, priming this, the cardiopulmonary bypass uh, without, trans, without uh, donor blood. And this paved the way for Cooley to pioneer bloodless surgery in cardiac surgery in response to patient requests. So Jehovah's Witnesses were having trouble getting heart surgery at this time. Uh, large volumes of transfusion were, 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 were given during heart surgery and most considered impossible to do it without blood. However, Cooley, in response to patient request, uh, developed techniques to make it possible in the early 1960s to perform heart surgery without transfusion. He developed this, this perioperative approach, which involved optimizing patients prior to surgery, minimizing blood loss intraoperatively. And then he got to appreciate the, the tolerance of anemia postoperatively and so tolerating anemia and uh, while supporting the patient to recover their own red blood cells. We had the privilege of interviewing uh, Dr. Cooley when he was 92 years of age, still working four days a week at the Texas Heart Institute he founded. And this is what he said about outcomes in this patient group. One critical group of patients were people who refused uh, to accept blood transfusion. This is a, a religious group known as the Jehovah's Witnesses. And I could compare those patients who ha had no blood products whatsoever uh, with another a group of patients who underwent conventional sort of uh, blood replacement. And the results were seemed to be better in terms of morbidity and mortality among those patients uh, who had re refused blood transfusion. So Cooley observed that when transfusion was avoided in patients, they had improved outcomes. And so he recommended broad replication of this. However, despite Cooley's fame, this amazing picture here of surgeons from all over the world visiting to observe Cooley and his team, um, despite this acclaim, uh, his recommendations of broader replication of bloodless surgery were not generally uh, taken up. And um, it really uh, wasn't until another landmark in history was the development of bloodless medicine surgery programs. Uh, the first appearing in uh, California in the US in, 19, in the 1970s, uh, a second in the 80s. And they adopted a similar approach to Cooley, but in a very coordinated, comprehensive multidisciplinary, multimodal team approach. And this um, first group in California published some of their results 
in, in this journal in uh, 19, uh, when was this, 1986, uh, where they reported on over 10,000 patients operated on without blood transfusion. And they said, including in this group are two patients of the Jehovah's Witness faith who underwent life-saving surgery with hemoglobin levels of less than two grams. Now, this was a, a pretty confronting thing at the time to think you would take patients to surgery without blood with a hemoglobin of two. And this is uh, one of the case reports that included the young woman who was transferred from another hospital to their hospital, a hemoglobin of 1.7 grams per deciliter or 17 grams per litre. And she'd continued to bleed postpartum. They took her straight to surgery to stop the bleeding. They gave her their hemoglobin building formula. And 10 days later, she was discharged to home with a hemoglobin of seven grams per deciliter or 70 grams per litre. Now, that was hard to comprehend by many. First of all, uh, hemoglobin that low wasn't considered compatible with life without transfusion, and it wasn't considered physiologically possible for hemoglobin to rise that quickly. Here's the hemoglobin billing formula, and they made this comment, Ritz report, not available at this stage, but they made this point, there's a lag period of 24 hours, after which hemoglobins rise an average of 0.4 one grams per deciliter per day, or uh, um, four, 40 uh, grams per liter per day. Now, uh, four, sorry, four grams per liter per day. Now, most of the textbooks will tell you hemoglobins only raise about what rise about one gram per deciliter per week with oral line supplementation. So many found this uh, hard to comprehend. So these programs adopted this perioperative approach, optimizing patients preoperatively, uh, techniques to reduce blood loss, surgical anesthetic techniques, and then also developing this, this uh, understanding of the physiological uh, tolerance reserve to tolerate anemia with appropriate management. So in 1990, I was involved in setting up uh, the first bloodless medicine surgery program in Australia. Uh, based again on these basic principles that Cooley developed and these programs were, were applying. This was the first in Australia, one of only about three or four in the world. And it, it was set up uh, to accommodate, again, uh, patients requesting not to have transfusion, but the medical advisory board at the time was very visionary and, and they saw this as really the way medicine had to go. This, this, this should be for all patients. And so later, it was changed to a blood conservation program. And we published some of our early results where we saw dramatic reductions in transfusion with improved patient outcomes. And this, this hospital eventually achieved a 0% transfusion rate in total hip and knee replacement surgery, which was traditionally a large consumer of transfusion. Now, of course, we, like other programs, uh, very early on got confronted with a hemoglobin of two when everyone asked, well, what do you do? So we uh, developed a, a comprehensive protocol a bloodless management of severe anemia. And uh, we, um, this, this included uh, this hemoglobin maximization regimen of IV iron and ESA, vitamin B12, folic acid, vitamin C. We're looking at adding high dose vitamin D3 to this based on a recent uh, clinical trial. And we published the initial results in a series of seven patients with traumatic blood loss or critical bleeding. Now here's uh, just an example of one case report. Here is a, a young woman who was who presented to a, a regional country hospital uh, with a ruptured ectopic pregnancy and within four hours of being admitted, her hemoglobin dropped from 114 to 32 or 3.1, uh, 3.2 grams per deciliter. Now she was taken straight to surgery to stop the bleeding. The surgeon found five liters of blood in her abdomen and postoperatively, her hemoglobin was 18 grams per liter. She was then transferred via air ambulance, 800 kilometers to a, a tertiary care hospital intensive care, at which time the intensivist called me and said, we had this patient with a hemoglobin of 17 grams per liter, what can we do? So we supplied the protocol, which they followed, included intubating the patient, administering high FI2. Uh, they employed other techniques, including instituting the hemoglobin maximization protocol. Now she was extubated the, um, extubated the next day. Uh, the intensivist rang me the following night saying he was amazed that she was sitting up in bed talking. And the following morning, morning she was discharged from, uh, from ICU and discharged her home 
uh, on day 10 with a hemoglobin of 72 grams per litre. At follow-up, the hemoglobin on day 19 was 108 grams per litre. Now you can see the course of her recovery here. Uh, she was admitted and bled here to surgery here, transported, arrived with this hemoglobin. You can see this steady, uh, rapid increase in her hemoglobin after administration of this protocol. So the hemoglobin rose after six days, an average of 5.7 grams per litre per day. Um, so this is much more than what most appreciate. And after 19 days from, from her nadir, it rose 4.8 grams per litre per day on, on average. Here's a second case. This is the 15 year old surfer who had uh, his leg bitten off above the knee by a great white shark. Uh, this is a life threatening injury. It was on a remote beach on the southwest coast of Western Australia. And fortunately for him, there was a nurse there on holidays and she applied a tourniquet. He was then driven by his friends in the back of a motor vehicle 80 kilometres to the nearest small country hospital. And he was then flown by air ambulance 700 kilometres to the state major trauma centre where we had this protocol. And you can see the course of his treatment here. He was taken for emergency surgery. His hemoglobin was 91, so we'd lost about a third of his blood volume. He lost further blood during surgery and post-optively his nadir was 55 where he was given this hemoglobin maximization protocol. And you can see the response from there. So from day two to 11, his hemoglobin rose an average of 4.6 grams per litre per day. From days five to 11, it rose 6.2 grams per litre per day. And overall, from day two, from his nadir to day 40, his hemoglobin rose 2.5 grams per litre per day across that period and return to normal at 40 days. Now, this is particularly interesting with a, a recent uh, study uh, showing that uh, critical, critically ill patients who are discharged from hospital anemic are still anemic, 45% are still anemic 12 months later. His hemoglobin returned to normal at 40 days, just over a month. 14 years on, he's now married and still loves the ocean and still uh, heads back to the ocean doing very well. So here's a summary of these six cases. As you can see, there's a, there's a consistent linear increase in hemoglobin. And overall, the post nadir hemoglobin rose uh, from 6.9 to 6.1 grams per litre per day. A very interesting lesson to learn from these uh, bloodless surgery patients. So others, of course, have published series with similar experience that underpins this, this tolerance of anemia and a rapid recovery with appropriate, appropriate therapy. So by 2000, when I was invited to write this book on the subject, there were over 200 of these programs around the globe. Uh, professional societies began to appear. Um, and this is a bit of history here, Dr. Shander and Professor Richard Spence in 2002 at the inauguration of the uh, Society for the Advancement of Blood Management textbooks and new journals began to appear on the subject and international conferences began to be convened on this subject. Importantly, programs began to publish their results. And when we reviewed uh, all of these uh, published program results, there was this consistent picture that when you avoid transfusion, it results in reduced mortality, length of stay, reoperation, readmissions to hospital, complications, and reduced costs. However, despite these good outcomes, this did not result in a change to standard practice. It didn't get wide uptake. There were, however, some parallel things happening that had a synergistic effect. For example, in 1988, a very well-known hematologist and transfusion medicine specialist in Australia published an article in the Medical Journal of Australia calling for a paradigm shift in blood transfusion. There were many reasons for calling for this paradigm shift and uh, the literature, uh, we did a, a literature search and identified five drivers for bringing about this change from, from a product focus to a patient focus. And these included supply. There's an ongoing supply challenge, particularly with aging populations around the globe. And of course, in pandemics, that's become apparent. Uh, the burgeoning cost of blood, ongoing safety issues. Since 1914, 1940, sorry, 
there has been an average of 5.3 new infectious agents identified every year. That presents ongoing safety challenges. But the big two of concern, quality and efficacy and adverse outcomes. So in 1998, Richard Spence uh, published in the British Journal of Anesthesia this rather confronting statement. An extensive review of all the relevant clinical literature on transfusion studies, risks and benefits found no conclusive evidence of benefit from red blood cell transfusion. Now, what I uh, regard as a, a landmark study by our next speaker, Bruce Spies. I have a, okay where he raised this question for the first time about outcomes and asked the all-important question, does transfusion do what it is intended to do to improve or prevent adverse outcomes? He concluded, in summary, the data on outcomes and transfusion are worrisome. There are few, if any, articles that support transfusion actually improving patient outcomes. In fact, a large body of literature, literature began to appear showing that a transfusion was independently associated with a long list of adverse outcomes. Now, these uh, observational studies, and so there's always a need for caution with observational studies, and they don't in themselves can't establish a causal link. But nevertheless, it's important to not forget that uh, Sir Austin Bradford Hill, the father of the medical randomized control trial, which is now con considered the highest level of evidence, along with Sir Richard Dole, established the causal link between tobacco use and cancer without a randomized control trial. And as a result of that, was developed what's called the Bradford Hill criteria or the causality criteria, whereby one can establish causation from observation based on these, these uh, nine criteria. And, uh, in uh, 2011, Isbister and colleagues published this article applying the Bradford Hill criteria to the adverse uh, outcomes associated with transfusion as to establishing causality. Now, one of those uh, criteria, criteria involve a dose response relationship. And uh, here's a summary of the, the body of literature that shows a dose response relationship between transfusion and adverse outcomes. So with every unit given, the risks increase. Uh, so this is seen consistently in the trauma, critical bleeding population, critical care, cardiac surgery, and other populations. Here are the numbers of, numbers of patients here, and you can see this consistent picture of a dose response relationship between transfusion and adverse outcomes. In the last 20 years, there have been a, a large number of randomized controlled trials published comparing liberal versus restrictive transfusions. And this is considered high level, the highest level of evidence and systematic reviews and their analyses of these randomized control trials have been conducted. So Kevin Trentino and colleagues uh, just, uh, just this year published this systematic review of systematic reviews. Now, this is called an overview. So an overview of systematic reviews and meta-analyses comparing mortality in restrictive versus liberal hemoglobin threshold randomized controlled trials. Now, this included 53 unique clinical trials that reported 19 systematic reviews and pooled by 33 meta-analyses. Now, in the meta-analyses graded as high to moderate level of evidence, 25% favored restrictive, as in restrictive transfusion reduced mortality. 75% found no difference or no benefit from liberal transfusion thresholds. What was identified, however, were some limitations with randomized control trials. And so this follow-up publication where uh, the point was made by the authors that, that randomized control trials are not uh, threshold randomized control trial trials, that is, are not, not designed to specifically test the efficacy of transfusion. They test the effect of one threshold compared with another transfusion threshold. They don't compare transfusion with placebo or transfusion with another intervention. 
So it's large observational studies that uh, compare transfused patients with matched non-transfused patients that are trying to address that question of the effect of transfusion on outcome. Please look at the effect of thresholds. Now, the authors also said that this overview uncovered un under-recognized issues limiting interpretation of RCTs and challenged the dogma that RCTs by default automatically provide the best level of evidence for patient blood management. So in this uh, recent uh, study, uh, which uh, interestingly was, was, uh, was runner-up study paper of the year in the journal Anesthesia, uh, looked at trying to determine if there is a hemoglobin concentration where transfusion is effective. It used an interaction model between anemia and transfusion in surgical patients and it adjusted for the effect of transfusion on outcomes at various levels of hemoglobin. You can see the levels here. So what this did was it looked at within each of these levels of hemoglobin, it uh, compared transfused patients with matched non-transfused patients to see the effect of transfusion if there was a point where transfusion became beneficial. It included over 60,000 patients. Uh, you can see the surgical populations here and the main outcomes, the primary outcomes were mortality and length of stay. So mortality included in hospital mortality, 30 day and one year mortality. And here are the outcomes. So here are the hemoglobin ranges along the bottom here. Here is um, the, the, the divider here between this side favoring uh, no transfusion, this side favoring transfusion. Now, as you can quickly see from hemoglobins of 19 above, transfusion was independently associated with increased mortality compared with non-transfused patients. From 89 down, there was no difference. So uh, no benefit from transfusion, even down to hemoglobins of less than 60. Now the confidence interval is getting wide here because of small numbers clearly, but uh, this showed no significant difference. This is a uh, 30 day mortality, similar picture, increased mortality here, no difference or no benefit here. Uh, this is a uh, one year follow-up, similar picture, increased mortality here and no benefit here, although, uh, the point estimates seem to favor no transfusion, but importantly, no significant difference. A little bit of a different picture with length of stay. At every hemoglobin level down to 60, transfusion was associated with increased length of stay. The literature also identifies this triad of independent risk factors for adverse outcomes. Anemia, for example, if a patient uh, according to a large systematic review, if a patient is anemic prior to surgery, they are three times more likely to die. They are almost four times more likely to suffer acute kidney injury, a twofold increase in infection, an increased stroke in cardiac surgery, hospital length of stay, and increased risk of transfusion. In cardiac surgery and, and other patient populations, it's been shown that iron deficiency without anemia is also independently associated with, with increased mortality and increased morbidity, ICU and hospital length of stay, and increases the risk of transfusion. Blood loss is another independent risk factor for adverse patient outcomes, and this is severity dependent. And transfusion to treat anemia and uh, blood loss is an independent and additive risk factor. Now, these uh, three uh, risk factors are modifiable risk factors with what has been referred to as the three pillars of patient blood management. I know BMSS has four pillars. Traditionally, there's been three pillars to address these three risk factors. So in 2005, uh, Professor James Isbister proposed the term patient blood management. This was another landmark in history. Now, the reason for this was to encourage a change in focus from a product focus and making the blood as safe as possible to the patient, getting back to managing the patient. He didn't see this as an intervention. Um, it was patient specific approach he was talking about. And it was about managing the patient's blood like any other organ or organ system with the aim of improving patient's clinical outcomes. Now, here's a consensus definition of patient blood management. There are a number that have appeared over time, but this is a consensus definition uh, at an international summit conducted in Australia 
and sponsored by the International Foundation for Patient Blood Management. It's a concise definition that's, that's uh, each expression has meaning. And you'll see echoes of bloodless surgery in this. For example, it's described as an evidence-based approach. It's important to understand what evidence-based medicine actually means. Here is a definition, the integration of best research evidence with clinical expertise and patient values. So in evidence-based medicine, in the true definition of evidence-based medicine, the patient is at the center of this, patient values or patient preferences. Now you might recall, this is where Cooley started, accommodating patient values and, and preferences. It's a bundle of care. It's not a bundle of interventions, but a bundle of care. There are multiple interventions within that, and it's about optimizing both medical and surgical patient outcomes by clinically managing. Clinically managing is always referred to diagnosis first. Don't start with the answer, start with the problem. What's the problem the patient has got? And then working one's way through to appropriate treatment and follow-up. And it's about managing and preserving the patient's blood. As this editorial reminds us, our own blood is still the best thing to have in our veins. So in 2007, the Executive Committee of the West Australian Department of Health commissioned us to design and implement the world's first health system-wide patient blood management program. It adopted a programmatic approach uh, based on a predefined program design. Now for this program, a, an extensive literature review was conducted to design the program. It looked at change management literature, but it also looked at all of these successful hospital-based programs. And so it really drew on all this collective experience to design a health system-wide approach to patient blood management. And it proposed that the mitigation of these three risk factors by the application of the three pillars of patient blood management may achieve improved patient outcomes with the corollary of reduced transfusion and reduced costs. It employed multiple strategies from learning from experience. We won't have time to go into those today. Um, it developed this nine field, three pillar, nine field matrix. So the three pillars applied in three phases, pre, inter and post-operatively. For medical patients, it was pre-treatment, treatment and post-treatment. So apply to, to both patients, uh, medical patients and surgical patients. As you can see within this matrix, there are multiple strategies. There's, uh, there's diagnosis, there's monitoring and strategies. One of the strategies we focused on was, um, of course, this is all applied, very importantly, it's applied in a very patient specific way. One of the areas we focused on was the second pillar and reducing blood loss. And uh, many will know Dr. Manny Estioko, who um, became uh, one of the leading bloodless cardiac surgeons. And I've known and worked with Dr. Estioko for many years and learned many things uh, from him. He uh, always talked about and promoted white towel surgery. Uh, he was a protege, friend and colleague of Denton Cooley. And uh, certainly he was a master of surgical hemostasis. So, so we brought him over to Western Australia as part of a uh, perfectorship to conduct some demonstrational surgery, conducting some workshops. And we actually helped with his help design a surgical hemostasis training program for surgeons. And this had uh, quite an impact on surgical blood loss, which we, we tracked with data. So what were the results of putting this all together? We published the results in transfusion. Uh, it included over 605,000 patients. These were all emergency and elective adult patients to the four major uh, tertiary care hospitals in the capital city of Perth. This included our state uh, major trauma center. It included the state referral obstetrics, high risk obstetrics center, the burn center, uh, transplant centers, it included all the major hematology departments. This was all patients with this broad approach applied to them. It's important to recognize that this program started in a state with the lowest red cell transfusion rate in the Western world. Um, you can see the comparisons at the time there and the Australian Red Cross Blood Service uh, used to often say that this was a result of a program we started that first hospital in 1990. It had a broad impact on practice. It also started off with a relatively restrictive 
pre-red cell transfusion hemoglobin threshold, again, because of this conservative approach. So despite starting there at six years, implementation of this program was associated with a hospital-wide risk-adjusted reduction in mortality by 28%, infection by 21%, uh, AMI stroke by 31%, and length of stay by 15%. So improved patient outcomes, which was the proposal of the program. It also, despite already having a low transfusion rate, reduced transfusion significantly, 41% for red cells, 47% for plasma, and 27% with platelets and cost savings. Uh, an 18.5 million saving in direct product costs and with activity-based costs, it was estimated to be 80 to $100 million. That was quite a return on investment with improved outcomes. Uh, this uh, paper in transfusion attracted global attention. It's, it has the highest health, health metric score for the journal transfusion. It's in the top 5% of all research outputs ever tracked by health metric. And this model has now been taken up in many countries around the world. So we've looked at a number of uh, aspects of this, and this was an important one we just recently published. It's been shown that this approach reduces costs, but the big question is, is it cost effective? So we looked at this in colorectal surgery. We looked at a, a pre-op clinic to optimize patients that screened and evaluated anemia and iron deficiency and treated iron deficiency anemia and suboptimal iron stores prior to surgery. Here are the, uh, the details of the study, but just focusing on the outcome here, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio was a saving per patient of $3,776. Now multiply that up by thousands of patients and you see this is a, this is a very important outcome. So for every thousand, it's over $3.7 million in savings. Now, what this means is the cost of the clinic, the cost of screening, treating, which includes lab tests, uh, nursing time, uh, physician time, iron consumables, uh, all those costs were outweighed several fold by the reduced hospital costs. And despite starting off with a very low transfusion rate, uh, it was a 52% reduction in transfusion. And in a parallel study, we've just published on net cost analysis of 15% reduction in mean hospital length of stay. So we were then invited by uh, North American and European investigators to collaborate on this systematic review and meta-analysis of multimodal patient blood management programs based on the three pillar strategy. That was the inclusion criteria. 17 studies from programs were identified, including over 230,000 surgical patients. And again, a consistent picture, a significantly reduced transfusion, hospital length of stay, total complications and mortality. So what are the implications from a historical perspective of what has developed over time? Well, this article in transfusion spoke, sorry, in nature referred to transfusion, transfusions as one of the most overused treatments in modern medicine at a cost of billions of dollars and associated with negative outcomes. This uh, global health report by Deloitte in 2016 referred to the global health sector's challenge to improve patient outcomes with increasingly restricted funding. We know that's a major issue for health around the globe. This article in the New England Journal of Medicine referred to the era of shifting more and more economic resources toward healthcare is going to end. The medicine of the future will focus on more efficient use of resources. There are few area, very few areas in health where you can improve patient outcomes while reducing costs. Bloodless surgery and patient blood management that's grown out of it has shown it can do this. And now, there is global uptake of patient blood management with whole jurisdictions, countries and areas taking up patient blood management. So as Albert Einstein said, if you want to know the future, you need to look to the past or at the past. From a historical perspective, this is really back to the future. What uh, the approach that Denton Cooley developed right back in the early 60s 
is now being referred to as in these two editorials, the new standard of care and not implementing patient blood management represents substandard care. Thank you very much for your kind attention.